Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. We are we have people from Latin America, North America, and Europe. Uh, it will be yeah, good evening. We are, we have just one second. Uh, so we have people from Latin America, North America, and Europe here with us today. So if you are from different another country so please right here in the chat on youtube it will be a big pleasure for us my name is igor viegas i work for petrobras in the rdc r d center for me it's a big pleasure to stay here to open the alago webinars event that will be a series of webinars during this month uh, i would like to say thank you for the organizing committee for the invitation and the sponsor to support this initiative uh, Alago is association is a very important tool uh, to connect the organic geochemistry group, stimulate the advances of the science and the emerging of the new generation. Uh, this indication is an honor for me. Today we are doing a campaign in order to stimulate new members for Alago Association. The link for the registration is in the YouTube chat. Don't lose the opportunity to, to join us. The new board are preparing uh, very new things for our community. Today, we have a great pleasure to have Ken Peters with us to present chemometrics assessment of petroleum system and the pilot climate using crude oil biomarker and isotope data from Santa Marta Basin, in California. Uh, the work shows cases the power of the chemometrics to distinguish oil families and present explanations for those families based on the pile of climate change during the deposition of the Miocene source rocks in the Santa Marta Basin, applying uh, both molecular biomarker distribution and isotope data. Uh, Ken Peters retired as a geochemistry <laughs> advisor for Shalom BG in 2020, uh, where he used uh, geochemistry and numeric modeling to study petroleum system. He has 42 years of experience with Chevron, Mobile, ExxonMobil, USGS, UC Berkeley, Stanford University, and Shilun Berger, and published around 200 pre uh, reviewed geology, geochemistry, and basic modeling books and papers. He was honorary teacher, teaching fellow at the University of Aberdeen and visiting professor at Jacobs University in Germany. He, he is the principal author of the Biomarker Guide 19, 1993 and 2005, editor of the, uh, of the 2009 AAPG Compact Disc Getting Started in the Basin and Petroleum System Modeling, and principal editor of 2012 AAPG Hedenberg Series Volume of Basin Modeling. The, the, the title is The New Horizons in the Research and the Applications. He has received a lot of awards from different associations. And in 2019, Ken, Ken received uh, AAPG's highest honor, the Sydney Powers Memorial, Memorial Awards at the AAPG ACE in San Antonio. Ken has a uh, BA in uh, master degrees in geology from UCSB and PhD in geochemistry from UCLA. So, Ken Peters, thank you for accepting our invitation. So, the floor is yours. Please, you have 50 minutes of presentation, and after we'll have 10 minutes of questions. So, if you want to ask some question, please write in the chat of the YouTube. In the end, we will make this, we will ask these questions. So the floor is yours, Ken. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Igor. I, I really appreciate that. I wanna start by saying that uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee of Alago for inviting me to be the first speaker in this series. I consider it an honor, and I will try to make my talk as interesting as possible today. I'm told that we have well over 400 uh, well, hundred, well over 400 people in the audience, so I'll try not to be nervous, and I'll try to do a good job presenting this work. Uh, this study is uh, was something that I actually published uh, in 2019, but I'm going to tell it in a little bit different way today, uh, emphasizing some of the isotope results along with the chemometrics. Uh, 
in the title slide here, you can see uh, this is a photograph uh, of our annual meeting for the Stanford Basin and Petroleum System Modeling Industrial Affiliates Program. And this is from 2017, and we had that in the Santa Maria Basin. This is a very interesting coastal basin in California, in the United States. And uh, it, it is basically has one source rock. Okay, so early studies of this basin played a key role in the development of petroleum geochemistry. The first geochemical study suggested one oil type that was derived from the Miocene age Monterey formation. However, the reasons for geochemical differences among the Santa Maria Basin oils have remained controversial for many years. Some people talk about differences in thermal maturity, differences in biodegradation, differences in expulsion timing, and of course, potential differences in the source rock organophases. We're gonna talk about that today. It's a very interesting story. Uh, we could have not, we could not have uh, come to the conclusions we came to in this study without the power of good biomarker and isotope analysis combined with multivariate statistics. So we're not relying on bivariate plots of the data. We're looking at multivariate statistics to, uh, uh, to, to make the conclusions about these, uh, these Monterey oil families that I'm going to talk about. I would like to start by describing, um, let's see if I can switch the, switch the page here. Hmm. There we go. Yes, I'd like to start by describing what's called the Monterey hypothesis. This has been uh, around for a number of years. Um, Vincent and Berger in 1985 were the first people to describe this. It's fairly controversial. There's some uh, issues about the mechanisms involved, but before we talk about the purpose of this study, I want to describe this Monterey hypothesis. This is a, this is a present day sort of view of uh, the west coast of Peru. It could be North America, west coast of North America, could be the west coast of uh, you know uh, Namibia, uh, West Africa. Uh, we have uh, uh, coastal currents that result in upwelling, okay? upwelling. And the interesting thing about upwelling is it supplies uh, limiting nutrients uh, in, in the growth of phytoplankton. So things like phosphorus and nitrogen are brought up. This is a shallow water phenomenon. It's usually no more than about 200 meters water depth that uh, we're, we're, we're talking about here. But this is really a very critical thing and it, it supports a tremendous uh, 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 fisheries industry because of this upwelling, these phytoplankton can really take off and generate tremendous amounts of uh, biomass. In the Monterey uh, hypothesis, uh, we can look back to the early to mid Miocene. Uh, there were paleogeographic changes that resulted in widespread deposition of organic rich sediment in areas of these, these sort of areas where we have coastal upwelling. And the result was, uh, uh, these, these tremendous blooms of phytoplankton, when those phytoplankton die, when the upwelling stops, these are usually driven by winds uh, between the land and the sea. That upwelling, when it stops, uh, usually it's, a, it's, a, it's an annual thing. When it stops, those phytoplankton uh, die off and there's a tremendous drawdown of oxygen in the water column as that organic matter sinks and is biodegraded. We call that biological oxygen demand biological oxygen demand, and that results in anoxia in the underlying, uh, in the underlying water column and sediments. Uh, deposition of carbon-12 enriched organic matter in the Monterey and its equivalent around the Circum Pacific uh, really resulted in uh, that, that drawdown of carbon dioxide. And many people associate that with global cooling uh, and a systematic increase in the carbon isotope uh, value of kerogen. In other words, more C13 in the kerogen that's being deposited. <clears throat> that, of course, translates into the crude oils as well. 
So let's look a little more detail at this. This now is the, I'm having a little difficulty switching, uh, switching the slides here for some reason. Here we go. Uh, this, this slide shows uh, kind of what happens when we have that tremendous biological oxygen demand. Imagine you have a, a, an algal bloom up here, a lot of phytoplankton, a lot of bioproductivity. We're taking CO2 out of the water and with photosynthesis, we're fixing it to make biomass and oxygen. Now, when those organisms die off, that's the critical point because that organic matter drops down through the water column and it is food for all kinds of different organisms on the way down through that water column. And we're reversing that reaction now. We're taking oxygen to oxidize the organic matter to CO2. So uh, that biological oxygen demand, if we had a tremendous bloom of phytoplankton, that can result in a drawdown of oxygen to the point where there is no more oxygen, even in the water column. Here you can see in the water column, there's no more oxygen. This is anoxic water. Well, aerobes, like you and me, we breathe oxygen, uh, burrowing uh, you know, fish and burrowing uh, worms and clams that would normally bioturbate the sediment here are no longer able to survive because of the oxygen content is so low. This is anoxic. And so we get annual deposition of these varves, uh, laminated organic rich sediment, good preservation of organic matter because now we've switched from aerobic organisms to sulfate reducers, or of methanogens. And these are much less uh, efficient at, uh, uh, at degrading that organic material. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Oh. I'm trying to switch the slide and I'm unable to switch the slide. There we go. Um, so the result of this, uh, for example, present day on the Peruvian shelf, is uh, a tremendous uh, uh, drawdown of oxygen. And you end up with an anoxic layer, an oxygen minimum layer. And this could extend for many hundreds of kilometers offshore. Uh, the key point here is that it can be, the water column can be oxic above and below that minimum zone. But where that oxygen minimum zone impinges on the shelf, that's where we get this very good organic matter preservation. And normally, because of uh, isotopic fractionation, that organic matter is going to be enriched in the isotope carbon-12 as opposed to carbon-13. Okay, so we'll talk more about that a little bit, uh, a little bit later in the talk. If you look at this in map form, you can see that uh, this is from a paper by Gerard de Maison and Moore way back in 1980. It's still a classic paper, by the way. Uh, you can see here on the west coast of Peru or the west coast of North America or offshore Namibia, we have these zones of uh, anoxia and those impinge on the shelf. And so we can get tremendous deposition of uh, uh, many cases, oil prone organic matter. And that drawdown of the CO2 uh, has been associated with global cooling and eventually an increase in the carbon isotope value of the carrageen and the corresponding crude oils. So this is a, uh, a present-day spectroscopic view of the same thing from 1980 up to present day. Basically, this is the partial pressure of oxygen in that water column at its minimum. And so you can see this is really an important process. So let's talk about uh, now the uh, sort of the purpose. We've talked about the Monterey hypothesis and, and an ex maybe an explanation for the very oil-prone uh, uh, Miocene Monterey source rock. This is the purpose of the study. It's multi-purpose. Uh, we're going to look at the onshore and the offshore equivalents of the Santa Maria Basin in coastal California. We're going to identify genetic oil families using biomarker and carbon isotope data for 48 crude oils. We started with uh, more like 65 crude oils, but we had to restrict and remove some samples because they were heavily altered by biodegradation or thermal maturation. I'll talk about that in a little bit. We then created a chemometric decision tree based on a training set 
from this from these 48 samples and those associated data. And we use that chemometric decision tree to classify newly collected samples. So this is a very powerful tool and it's, uh, it's, it's multivariate. I'm gonna comment on uh, what many people call early maturation from sulfur-rich carogen, like the Monterey formation. It may not be as early mature as many people say. And I'm also gonna talk about uh, this mid-Miocene paleoclimatic cooling as an explanation for distinct oil families in the Santa Maria Basin. This is a map of the Santa Maria Basin. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the onshore basin. There's a basement high here uh, where the structural styles, the, the tectonic domains are a little different on each side of this basement high. Um, these are, uh, this is very thin neogene sediments here. So basically these are isolated from each other. There's a major fault here called the Hosgrey Fault Zone. Fold axes and fault trends in the offshore basin are basically sub-parallel with that Hosgrey Fault Zone. But onshore, uh, those, those fold axes and fault trends are more or less uh, east-west to northwest-southeast. So you see the basin here, and I've actually, uh, I've actually shown you now some of the families. These are not all the same. Even though we, we know they're all coming from the Miocene Monterey Formation, and we know that from the isotopes, the very distinct isotope compositions, and where the oils are found, most of them are actually in the Monterey Formation. Um, but I've, I've, added, I've actually added in a syncline here to show you um, in, in stipple here, 7,000, this is 7,000 feet. You can see there are two synclines here with a high in the middle. These are giant fields. Uh, the Cat Canyon, the Santa Maria Valley, and also the Orchid field are giant fields that are over 100 million barrels. Okay, so uh, how are we going to do this chemometric or multivariate uh, statistical analysis of all these data? Well, we're going to carefully evaluate the extent of biodegradation, thermal maturity, and look at the data quality for all the oil samples. We don't want uh, altered biomarker data or altered isotope data in our training set. So we're going to do a screening first. Uh, that, that requires some geochemical expertise. Then we're going to select only the good source-related ratios, right? No maturity-related or other ratios, source-related ratios. This includes biomarker homolog ratios and, of course, stable carbon isotope ratios. In this talk, I'm not going to talk about these other two key steps to successful chemometrics, but uh, these are described in several papers that I've written over the last few years. So let's talk about biodegradation first. This is the main uh, effect on some of the oils in the Santa Maria Basin. We started with about 65 oil samples from the onshore and offshore basins. 12 of those are non-biodegraded, so they would rank zero on this Peters and Muldowan scale. It's many people call it the PM scale now. Uh, so they would rank zero. They're basically non-biodegraded. Then we had 32 mildly degraded oils in the range of say a one to a three rank, PM rank one to three. We had another uh, four samples that were moderately degraded that had uh, PM ranks of four to five. And then we had 17 heavily biodegraded oils that had a rank of six or more. Now you can see the differential biodegradation here. The microbes, they, they prefer these uh, alkanes or the, the, uh, the uh, acyclic isoprenoids. They're pretty easy to biodegrade, but something like this, a stearine is much more difficult. This is definitely a nonlinear scale here. The stearines are much more difficult to degrade. And we want to use those stearines and terpenes and diastearines for our geochemical correlation. So what we're going to do is we're going to screen out any samples that show evidence of a six or more. So if there's any evidence of degradation of the stearanes, and there's the C27 stearane cholestane, uh, we're going to remove those samples uh, from that. So there's an initial uh, uh, screening of the data. We can bracket the extent of biodegradation using this PM scale. 
And 17 of those samples were heavily degraded and would fall in this pink area right here. So here's some examples of those guys. Here are three oils. This one is from Cariaga. Um, that one is a PM rank zero, and you can see it's got the full suite of N-alkanes. Pristane and Phytane are there. Uh, basically an unaltered oil. We've got nice pristane NC17 ratio, phytane NC18, pristane to phytane, and a diastereine to regular sterine. We can see on the uh, M over Z217 trace. Now here's an oil that's a PM rank four, right? So we've not gotten into the sterines yet, but we have uh, biodegraded most of the alkanes in this range. And so our Pristane NC17 and phytane to NC18 ratios are not, we can't calculate them because there's no N alkane. And also there's a suspicious uh, pristane to phytane ratio. It looks like we may be altering the pristane and the phytane because this ratio, even though these oils are probably similar origin, this ratio looks like it might be altered a little bit. Diastereans, they look about the same. Here is an oil. Now we're going to take these two oils and, and include them in our study. But this is an oil right here uh, that represents a problem. It's a PM rank six. You can see we've degraded the N-alkanes, we've degraded the pristine and phytane, and we're certainly degrading the regular sterines because the diastereines that are more resistant to the sterines are giving us a really high ratio here. And you can see that in the, in the M over Z217 trace. So this one, we're not gonna include in our training set. Later we can come back once we build a training set and try to classify this sample, but it's not gonna be included in our training set. So we did, uh, the first thing we did was a hierarchical cluster analysis, and many of you have seen these. I've been, uh, this has been one of the themes in my career is trying to get geologists to use uh, more mathematics, to use more uh, chemometrics and uh, you, you'll see more and more in these, of these in the literature. And this is our, our chemometric analysis. This is a hierarchical cluster analysis dendrogram. Uh, we used 21 source-related biomarker ratios, and we had isotope ratios too. Carbon isotopes of the saturates, carbon isotopes of the aromatics, and the whole oil isotope, and the canonical variable as well. And you can see uh, I've got what I call a repeatability line here. See the dashed line? This is based on some essentially replicate samples here. The open stars here are uh, two samples from the same well, uh, slightly different depths, okay? Probably the same reservoir. And these are two samples, the solid stars are two samples from adjacent wells at overlapping depths. So these also are probably uh, the same samples. And you can see the tie points here between these cluster distances. This gives us a pretty good idea of repeatability. Anything that has a tie distance greater than that is distinct. So you can see uh, it's up to the operator here, the interpreter now, to place this similarity line. I chose to put it right here, which you know separates four from five, right? Uh, I could have moved it over more to the left, but I wanted to keep it fairly simple, six families. And you can see this, uh, these families I've color coded here. And this is the training set now. Now I've labeled these with some, normally uh, these would be lithology terms, but I will show you uh, why I think these are good organophases terms too. All of these oils are coming from the Monterey formation. They're not all the same. They're clearly different families here. Why is that? And that's part of the purpose of this work. The only way to really see that is to do uh, multivariate statistics, chemometrics. You can't do it with a bivariate plot. So I'm gonna call these moral families. And of course the end members here would be a carb these carbonate families. And I'm calling this a shale family. You see the cluster distance here for the shale family. It's really quite different based on those 22, 22 ratios from these other two super families, okay? So let's, uh, let's look at how I came up with these now organophases terms. I'm gonna show you a plot. This is a plot that is commonly used. Uh, I use it in my books and, and papers. Um, this, is, uh, this, this plot is based on tricyclic terpenes 
And uh, the results that I show here, shale, marl, carbonate, are based on uh, uh, basically more than 500 global oil samples that were analyzed where we had a good idea of what the source rock was like. So you can see here samples having very high C24 tricyclic terpenes. We're going to call those shale. And gee, guess what? That is family six. And these, this family right down here, uh, these families down here, we're going to go call carbonates because they're very high in the C22 tricyclic terpene. This is an empirical plot, and we've simply plotted our data for the Santa Maria Basin in there. Now, I've highlighted three families. These are the onshore families that we're going to talk about in the rest of this presentation. Two, four, and six. Two would classify as a marl. So we're going to call that the marl organophases. Six is going to classify as a shale. So it's a siliceous shale facies. Okay? And uh, four is going to be a carbonate facies. Well, when I first looked at this, I said, gee, these oils are not all the same. They're not just coming from a homogenous Monterey, Miocene Monterey source rock. There must be organophases variations within that source rock. And then I remembered some papers that I'd read uh, by Bramlett and also Piscioda and Garrison, and they showed in outcrop what the Monterey looks like uh, uh, in coastal California. Here we have, at the base of the Monterey, we have what's called the calcareous organophases, the calcareous facies, lithophases, and it's dominated by coccoliths and forams. These are carbonate tests. So this, this is a calcareous uh, facies right here. We're going to call that C. At the other extreme, at the top of the Monterey formation, we have what's called the siliceous facies, and it has its own name, the siliceous calcareous member. And we're going to call that S here. And it's dominated not by forums and coccoliths, but by radiolaria and diatoms. And of course, their, their tests are siliceous. They have siliceous tests. And the phosphatic or marl facies is sort of intermediate between these two. So there's a correspondence between the geochemistry here, the lithophases, and the geology in the outcrops along coastal California. So an organophases, you'll remember, is a mappable rock unit that contains a distinct assemblage of organic matter without regard to mineralogy. So what we're doing here is we're linking these mineralogical terms to organophases terms. So now I've just plotted these again. This is our, this is our plot. And it's very interesting. We've got these three onshore families, two, four, and six. And I always like to do this. I always like to make sure that the geochemistry makes sense with the geology. They have to agree with each other or there's something wrong. And you can see right away that we've got something here that is geologically significant. The geochemistry is telling us something that is geologically significant. Here, family two, this moral family, you can see is pretty much located here to the north of this uh, sort of depot center here. And some of those oils are found here in Orcutt, which is in this high between these two synclines. And then these uh, uh, sort of distal uh, siliceous or shale organophases are down here to the south. Okay, And uh, you can see that... Uh, the carbonate facies is over here toward the, the uh, nose of this, of this basin. Okay, So I've, I've highlighted here 7,000 feet. Actually, generation probably doesn't occur till about 9,000 feet in this basin. Uh, but I did that just so you could see where the depot center, where the deeps are in this basin, where generation might be occurring. And in the offshore, we won't talk much more about this, but you can see again, the geochemistry is fitting the geology very nicely. Here, family one, they're all right there in the Point Pedernales field. Okay, So let's, uh, let's look at a cross-section now and, again, check the geology to make sure it matches something with the geochemistry. We're going to go north from the north in the Santa Maria Valley field through the Orchid field down to the south in the uh, Lompo uh, field. And this is a cross-section now. 
Here's our 9,000 foot depth, which is the approximate depth, probably where generation is occurring in the, in the Monterey. And you can see, gee, uh, here are all these uh, uh, family two marl oils, most of them within the Monterey formation where the oil is here in green. And uh, we have some of those in the orchid field. Uh, you see this uh, steeply dipping and then fairly flat top. And then it's actually overturned here along the Parisima Solomon thrust. Uh, so we've got that. And then we've got our family six, our siliceous family or shale family over here. Now this is real data. So here's a sample that I have some trouble explaining. But, you know, this is a three-dimensional thing that we're trying to depict here in two dimensions. So this may have migrated in laterally from in or out of the page. But I think it's very, it's very convincing here that our geochemistry is saying something uh, relevant about the geology. So here's a complex table. I'm just going to spend a few minutes here talking about this table and these three families that we've described. 19 samples in family two three samples in family uh, four, and 10 samples in family six, the shale family. Well, look at the sulfur content. You know, uh, more than half a percent sulfur is high sulfur oil, right? Look at this, look at these oils, 8% sulfur in the carbonate oils, right? And that sort of matches with this dibenzothiophene ratio, high dibenzothiophene. The shaley facies, on the other hand, lower sulfur. It's still sulfur rich, but it's lower sulfur. And the marl is intermediate. Same story here with the dibenzothiophene ratio. Christine to phytane ratio says, gee, that carbonate setting at the base of the Monterey was more reducing, more reducing than the shale facies or the marl facies, right? And here we have diastereans. Again, diastereans uh, they're rearranged steranes. It takes clay catalysis to do that. And so these guys right here, this carbonate facies is lean in terms of clays, but the shale facies has lots of clays. So it, the geochemistry is making, making sense. We can look at individual parameters and it makes sense. Now, let's look at the maturity of these oils. This is the fastest reaction. I like to bracket thermal maturity by looking at fast reactions first and progressively looking at slower and slower reactions to bracket that level of thermal maturity. You can see all of these oils have reached the end point for this 22S ratio. They're all at end point. They're all thermally mature oil, right? They've gotten, they've got, gotten into the oil window. Now this moratane ratio is the next fastest ratio, right? It's, it's, it's a little more robust, takes a little more energy to make it go. And you can see this is actually, this actually is one of the few ratios that decreases with thermal maturity. It starts off about 15 and it goes down to about five. And you can see it's uh, low maturity, low maturity. And this one's uh, maybe a little bit more mature, but none of them have reached the end point of five. This one's getting close. And our steering isomerization ratios and this cracking ratio, they have not reached the end point at all, okay? So we can bracket the thermal maturity of these oils, right? Uh, and uh, this is important because we want to address uh, a longstanding uh, statement. Wilson Orr, who I used to work for when I was, uh, when I was at, at, at Mobile, Wilson Orr uh, came out with a statement that sulfur-rich Monterey carrageen generates oil at less than 0.4% vitronite reflectance equivalent. Okay, less than 0.4%. Well, let's look at that. Here is our 22S ratio. And you can see I've arranged these various biomarker maturity ratios here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna bracket the maturity. So we know that the endpoint has been reached for the 22S ratio because that's a fast ratio. So we're at least about 0.6% reflectance, not 0 0.4, 0 0.6. On the other hand, we have not reached the endpoint for the Moritane ratio. Uh, we're getting close on with one of those families, but not quite. So we can bracket the maturity between those two points our maturity, it must be around 0.6 to 0.7% uh, 
vitronite reflectance equivalent. And notice our stearate isomerizations were nowhere near their endpoint. So we've bracketed that thermal maturity right in here. So 35 years ago, Wilson Orr suggested that, you know, the Monterey sulfur rich oils generated at less than 0.4%. Well, early generation, of course, has been confirmed. It's been supported by kinetic studies, some of them my own, uh, you know, uh, but the biomarker data show that regardless of sulfur content, the oils achieved about 0.6 to 0.7% reflectance. So they're early oil window, but they're not 0.4%, okay? Uh, now I'm gonna shortcut a little bit. Uh, this is something that it would be really nice if we had time for me to talk about, but uh, I've constructed a decision tree, a chemometric decision tree, and I've done that using uh, uh, Kaneris neighbor and also Simca, soft independent modeling of class analogy. These are uh, chemometric methods that allow you to classify samples, new samples, uh, based on the training set. You remember we had those 48 samples with 21 ratios for each of those 48 samples and we constructed our hierarchical cluster analysis. Now we can use that as a training set to classify new samples. This is powerful. This is powerful because it allows us to classify samples that we, we, we didn't classify before without altering the training set. And also we can, we can assign a level of certainty. So not only can we assign a family to new samples that we find, we can also assign a level of certainty. Now I've made these words, but I can make these numbers too. I can give you numbers that give you a, a, a sense of the degree of certainty in that classification. So these two samples, unfortunately, whoever collected them forgot to record where they were from uh, within East Cat Canyon and the Guadalupe field. We can classify them though, even though this one's ranked five, we can classify it in family two. The certainty is, is low because it's, you know, it's a biode biodegraded at level five. But here's some, here's some other samples. We can drop those samples in using those same 21 biomarker and isotope ratios that we use to make the training set, we can classify this oil from the Lompoc field as a six, that's, that's subfamily six, which is that the silicious shale family with a high degree of certainty. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about the isotope uh, results and I'm expanding on this from what you'll see in the publication, which came out in AAPG Bulletin in uh, 2019. So this is a little bit different view now of these results. Uh, one of the things about this is you can see here, we have a binary plot, right? It's carbon isotopes of the saturated against the aromatics. And these were two of the parameters of those 21 parameters. So we're sort of taking this out and looking at it and gee, we're starting to separate the families even with these two parameters. There are those three onshore families and look, the, the, the classic uh, sort of shale facies is enriched in carbon 13. Whereas the carbonate facies is poor. It's more enriched in carbon 12. This is called a sulfur plot. These are obviously all marine oils but these Monterey oils, all marine Monterey oils, have different isotope compositions. They're all in the range of the Monterey, but they're different isotope compositions in those families that we've defined. So what's going on there? What, what, what could be causing that? Well, let's talk first about oxygen isotopes. We didn't me measure any oxygen isotopes in the study, but I'm gonna show you some uh, results of oxygen isotope studies that uh, describe the, uh, the paleoclimatology of the Monterey Formation. Um, this is, uh, these are two uh, uh, comparisons here. We've got a comparison of a warm situation. That would be like the, the carbonate, the basal Monterey, the carbonate uh, facies. We've got uh, water containing oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Evaporation, of course, there's a fractionation where you're going to favor this O16, and you get rain with runoff, and then you have your four AMs that are picking up that, uh, that, that isotope composition uh, in this sort of a, a, a situation. Now in a cool situation, 
This would be like an interglacial, like during the carbonate deposition, but in a cool situation, like at the top of the Monterey, when we get into the shale facies, the siliceous shale facies, it was a cooling trend. And I'll show you more about that in a minute. But here we have evaporation, C16 rich water that is deposited. Now we're forming ice sheets. So we've got a glacial period. That 16 ox oxygen means that the water down here is going to become progressively enriched in O18. And the, the carbonate is going to have O18 rich carbon, O18 rich oxygen in it. Okay, it's going to, it's going to record this uh, uh, glacial character as opposed to a warm uh, climatic maximum. Okay, so the organisms we're looking at, for example, this is a oridolysis, right, it's a benthic 4M, and you can pick those out of samples and measure their oxygen isotope uh, value through time to see changes from this sort of warm to this sort of cool setting. Now, there are two major reservoirs for oxygen, and we're going to see the same thing for carbon. I'm going to call them reservoirs. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're reservoirs. Uh, one is seawater, and the other is glacial ice. Okay? The same sort of thing happens with carbon. Here we have uh, a little bit of a complex figure, but they're basically two reservoirs for carbon. There's kerogen. And you can see the kerogen is, is negative compared to the carbonate reservoir. Carbonates, you know, we use uh, PD bolemnite as the standard. That's zero per mil, right? And kerogen is minus 21. Remember, we've got this photosynthesis going on, photosynthetic, photosynthetic fixation of carbon-12. These, these, these uh, uh, phytoplankton prefer the carbon-12, so we get a negative number for the kerogen. Now, there are two reservoirs, yeah? There are two reservoirs. This is a, a kinetic isotope fractionation right here. So there are two major reservoirs for carbon, carbonates, and kerogen. And you're going to balance the two depending on the, uh, uh, the paleo climate. So lighter, that is more C12 rich, uh, more C12 rich carbon isotope values in 4Ms tracks heavier kerogen. So they're going to be an inverse relationship here. When carbonates get heavier, the kerogen gets lighter. When the kerogen gets heavier, the carbonates gets lighter. So let's look at our C, M, and S again. These are some, uh, these are directly out of some papers that, in, that are in the literature. This uh, shows a cooling trend that you can see in the Monterey formation based on oxygen isotopes. Not the curve, this is just the trend. Uh, there's a trend of indicated of cooling. So we're going from a, from a, a, a climate optimum where it was warm and at the basal part of the Monterey, we had carbonate deposition, lots of forams and coccoliths. And then with cooling, we get more uh, this trend and you see the trend in the isotope composition of the foram. That's the same foram I just showed you. You see the isotope composition goes from uh, around two to get more negative, it's, it's, it's going toward a more uh, carbon-12 rich um, uh, carbonate, okay? Uh, so the carbonate is getting more uh, negative. So after cooling, after a climate optimum, decreases the carbon isotope value of 4M carbonate. And you can see it right there. So this is, a, this is a, you know, that red curve is the C13 of the 4M carbonate. And as the 4M carbonate gets lighter, the C13 of the organic matter, it gets heavier. So after that mid-Miocene climate optimum, global cooling increased the, the uh, equator to pole thermal gradient. Okay, so there's a bigger temperature contrast along the coast between the water and the land. And that strengthens coastal winds. And of course, coastal winds uh, uh, strengthen upwelling and bioproductivity like we talked about earlier and anoxia, okay? So this resulted in high organic matter and uh, phosphorus as well in laminated Monterey rocks down in here. The reasons for the cooling, um, well, there, there are various reasons and, and some of them are controversial. Some people say it's the, the, the drawdown of the CO2. There are other people that have other ideas and we could talk about those if you like. 
But let's just look at a model now that uh, this is a model from Michael Arthur, uh, who I really a, a great scientist for paleo environment. Um, this is a model response of marine carbonate uh, and kerogen. Here's the kerogen to a 50% increase in phosphate delivery rate. And he's applied this in his model. This is a mathematical model over 500,000 years. So he's got an upwelling event, you know, a lot of upwelling. And the upwelling event provides nutrients. The microbes take off, right? The model assumes variable isotopic difference between the carbonate reservoir and the organic carbon in the carriage in that other reservoir that decreases with increasing concentration of CO2 in the seawater. And it's inversely related to the algal growth rate. So what you see here is that uh, with that phosphate, you get this tremendous uh, increase in phytoplankton and that the C12 is being deposited in the sediments because they're anoxic. The C13 now is getting enriched. When you run out of uh, that, when you run out of that 500,000 year period, there's no more upwelling, then the carbonate starts to recover. But of course, you've trapped kerogen in the meantime. And the kerogen does the opposite. The kerogen gets isotopically heavier more enriched in carbon-13. And you can see Monterey carrageens are you know, in the minus 20 to minus 23 range, right? They're over here. So we see this, this inverse relationship between the carbonate reservoir and the organic matter reservoir. Now I've plotted our families on here. And the way I did that is I took the average of the saturate and the aromatic isotope composition, took that average, and then I added one per mil to get the kerogen composition, which is a reasonable assumption. And you can see here carbonate, that's the base of the Monterey, marl, and then the silicious shale up toward the top. Okay, so we can look uh, at this inverse correlation. You can see that inverse correlation here. This is the carbon isotope value of organic matter in various uh, uh, exposures of the Monterey formation in California. Shell Beach and Muscle Rock. And this is a uh, 4M, carbon isotope value of 4Ms uh, from around the world. And you can see during that climate optimum, the carbonate was, uh, in the, during the carbonate uh, period, we had carbon isotope values that were more negative. And now they're starting to get more positive with that change in the balance between carbonate and organic matter. So we have a cooling period starting after, after the climate optimum here in the early to mid uh, Miocene. And this is, sort of a inter, this is sort of interglacial. And now we're moving into a glacial period where the water is getting cooler and we're getting a change in the isotope composition. And remember the shale, family six, was enriched in carbon-13. And it plots right on the curve. Okay, well, some of that got pretty deep, but it, I think uh, it should be of it should be of interest to many of you because this is something that uh, uh, reflects on uh, not only uh, the petroleum systems in this basin but other basins as well, as well as paleoclimatology. So I've got some summary statements here I want to go through, and then we can entertain some questions. First, chemometric analysis of 21 biomarker and carbon isotope ratios for 48 oil samples identifies six genetic families. We could not have done this unless we had actually used chemometrics, multivariate statistics. You can't do it with binary plots. It's just, it's too complex a situation. But with multivariate statistics, it works just fine. We identified those six genetic families. Now we can go ahead and build a decision tree using those 48 samples and the 21 biomarker and isotope ratios for each oil to build a chemometric decision tree that we can classify new oils. And that doesn't alter the training set, that's good. And it quantifies the degree of certainty for each new assignment. Even if the oil is fairly biodegraded and we're starting to get into the stearine, we can still um, make an attempt to classify samples using that decision tree. The families show affinities to clay siliceous, carbonaceous marl, and lower calcareous siliceous members of the Miocene Monterey. These are exposed in outcrop along the coast 
and you can see this is the top of the section and this is the base of the section. The maturity for those families is about 0.6 to 0.7 using that bracketing method that I described. This is the equivalent, reflectance equivalent, more than the classic predictions of early oil from sulfur rich kerogen, where they say it's being generated at less than 0.4% reflectance. Upward changes in organophases, biomarkers, and isotopes for the oil families are linked to mid-Miocene paleoclimatic cooling after about 14 million years. This resulted in decreased carbonate from forams and coccoliths and increased silica from diatoms and radiolarians. And we see that in the, in the lithology, but also in the organophases when we look at the biomarkers that reflect organophases. Now, I will provide this uh, these slides to, to, uh, to uh, Alago. And these are some references. If you want to read more about this, uh, the paper that contains at least part of this discussion was published in AAPG Bulletin in 2019. This paper right here is a classic that describes the moderate hypothesis in more detail. And the mathematical model that we talked about from Michael Arthur is in this paper from Chemical Geology. But all of these are, are good papers uh, that you might want to look at in more detail. Okay, well, I don't know, uh, I've lost track of the time. I hope I'm on time and uh, I'm willing to entertain questions at this time. So thank you so much, Ken Peters, for this amazing talk. So we have 10 minutes of uh, questions section. So uh, I will select some of the, the questions that we have here. So the first one is from Jamie uh, Caesar. It's from Organic and Isotope Geochemistry at the Geological Survey of Canada, Calgary. Uh, uh, so I will re read the, the, the question. So can uh, extract extended tricycle terpenes, C31, C32, for example, are very common in some Triassic rocks from Canada. Are you familiar with the source of these compounds? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, these, these extended tricyclics have been used um, to, uh, to uh, infer uh, uh, even depositional, envi depositional environment and also age. Uh, some of those, uh, I think you're referring to a paper by Albert Holbaugh, who talked about some of these extended uh, tricyclic terpenes. Um, uh, there, the, the literature on it is a little vague in terms of where they're coming from, but uh, the, the common statement is that many of these are coming from um, Tasmanite type, uh, Tasmanite type organisms. They're particularly abundant in uh, Paleozoic uh, sediments. So thank you. Uh, uh, from from oils from Brazil, we have some oil families here from Brazil that present this these compounds, and looks like that they are more common, for example, in some carbonate source rocks here in, oil, in our oil, uh, oils from Brazil, some, some oil families from Brazil. So, but it, it's a very nice question. Yeah, in fact, we don't know. It's a, a, a herb observation. It's an empirical correlation, let me say like this. Yeah. But there is a dis this discussion in the, in the literature. Very nice. Thank you so much for your question. So the second question is from Débora Azevedo from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she, what do you uh, do with the samples that do not fit on your ideal oils? And what about the distinct oils not analyzed? Only source related parameters? In fact, there are, yes. there are three questions. <laughs> Yeah, I think I under, understand the question, and I'll just go back to that screening uh, figure. Let's see if I can get to it here. Um, it, you know, we had 60, originally had 65 oils in this study, and uh, of course there's a rigorous uh, look at the samples to make sure, gee, we don't want to be classifying these samples if the sterines 
if we're using sterians as a correlation tool, we don't want to classify samples if the sterians have been altered. So we, uh, like this sample right here, uh, was rejected initially. But uh, that doesn't mean we can't come back once we build a once we build a training set, as I show you in this figure. Once we build a training set, then we can build our chemometric decision tree, and that is uh, that chemometric decision tree um, takes those 21 parameters for a new sample, even if it's biodegraded into the sterines, and it 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 can allow us to still classify that sample, but it's gonna probably, if the sterians are altered, it's gonna probably come back and say, well, the, the assessment, the uncertainty is high, or the, the certain degree of certainty is, is low. Okay, this, this is a, this really summarizes, this really is a, a real summary of a lot of work here, but you can see here, for example, this sample uh, is a five and, uh, and you know we're getting close, probably maybe even starting to get into the steranes, and so uh, it's saying, well, it it doesn't fit very well. So what it does, what the chemometric decision does, it it looks in three dimensional space. It looks at the principal components uh, in in say PC one, PC two, PC three, and it sees, well, does this new sample fall within that ball of points that we define? as family two, or does it fall within the ball of points in three-dimensional space, principal component space, that, that belongs in family six, right? <clears throat> well, many samples, especially tough samples, are gonna plot outside that training set. So they may be close to that ball of points for family two. In this case, it says, yeah, it kind of looks like two, but it's not actually right within that. And you can actually attach a number to that fit. You can, you can actually attach a number to the degree of certainty in the classification. Here, for example, uh, this is a, an unaltered oil. That was a piece of cake. That was really easy. The, the, the decision tree says, well, it fits right inside that principal component space that we define as family six, right? So that's high degree of certainty. Here's a sample. This guy uh, from a Royal Grande is actually outside. It's outside the Santa Maria Basin, and we we ran it, and it comes back and it says, "Sorry, no fit, zero fit, no fit." So this says no match, and it doesn't even the certainty doesn't matter because it doesn't fit at all. <laughs> so this is a very powerful tool. Deborah, did I answer? Did I answer her your question? So Deborah will try to write here in the chat in the YouTube. So uh, maybe she can ask uh, other question or, or complement okay. the, the discussion. So, but we can we can uh, go to the another question from Gutierrez Salguero, from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, good evening, Mr. Peters. Congratulations for your presentation. Did you try to use your data to build uh, pre predictive models as example PLS? And if you don't mind, what's, what software did you use in your work? Okay, what was the, what was the acronym, POS, what is that? It's P a PLS. Oh, PLS, partial least squares. Yeah. Uh, uh, so partial least squares is another chemometric tool that we can use to predict. Uh, it's, it's a linear regression analysis and we can use it to predict properties. So for example, I could use a collection of biomarker ratios to predict uh, viscosity or to predict sulfur content or API gravity. Uh, no, I didn't do that. I could do that with this data set. Um, but, but I, I didn't do that with this, this data set. I've done it with other data sets where we use partial least squares to predict other properties that we maybe couldn't measure, that we couldn't measure but we want to know about. We can do partial least squares analysis. What was the other part of the question there, Igor? Uh, is what kind of software did you use? Oh, yeah. okay. So here's a free advertisement. I use different softwares. <laughs> 
but but the but the one I the one I really prefer is um, it's called Pirouette, and uh, it is uh, it's it's very tactile, very uh, very easy to use. It's uh, uh, um, manufactured by Infometrics, Infometrics, and they're in uh, they're in uh, uh, Bothell, Washington. And so uh, this that particular program has a whole suite of different chemometric tools. It has principal components, uh, hierarchical cluster analysis, partial least squares, uh, KNN, Simca. Uh, well, I can't list them all. There's so many different chemometric tools in there, and they're very powerful tools. I like the software, and if you need uh, information on that, particular software, I can provide it. I can also say that um, uh, Geomark Research in uh, in Houston, they also use uh, Pirouette and uh, uh, many, many of their, uh, many of their reports, their, uh, their, their reports are based on Pirouette uh, chemometrics. Nice. My first paper on chemometrics was in 1986 and uh, and John Zumberg came out with a, a paper in 1987, and we were using the same software back then. Thank you, Peter. So we have another question from Mario Rangel. Congratulations, Peter. You have been using the... Uh, let's wait just one or two minutes. So um, in this meanwhile, so I would like to say thank you for staying here with us. It's a big pleasure to have this big audience with us and i would like to say that we will have another presentation and in, in uh, may 6th so will be the next talk will be source rock types and oil generation potential uh, our uh, uh, presenter will be liliana lopez from ucv venezuela so i think that Ken Peter is, is returning Yeah, just one second. I think that Ken Peter is returning. And also, I would like to say thank you to our sponsors, the organizing committee for this amazing event. I think it's a very important for the geochemistry community here in Latin America. So Ken Peter is back again. So, uh, so we lost you for some moment. Yeah, for some minutes. for some reason it said uh, there was a problem. Okay, no problem, yeah. no problem. So I will repeat the 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 Mario's question. So congratulations, Peters, you have been using this chemometric approach for a long time. What kind of care on have to take to avoid bias in the in this kind of study? And I would like to add a little bit things because I write, I write some questions here. How important is the, the geological data, the stratigraphic data, and the knowledge about the source rock to separate the oil families? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's actually two. Those are two very good questions. Uh, first, first, the thing about the source rock, um, doing, uh, doing, oil to source rock correlations is much more difficult than doing oil to oil correlations for various reasons. You know, source rocks, uh, you know, you're generating oil from a thick section of rock. And so when you get discrete samples within that rock, they may not correlate simply to the oil that's been generated because it's a it's it's seeing the whole thing. Now there are ways of getting around that. One of those is called uh, distributed source rock analysis. For example, compound specific isotope analysis. You can you can look at the N alkanes, for example, and look at different extracts from different rocks, and then weight those weight those according to the hydrogen index to get a match. With the oil, and some people have done that. Uh, in fact, in Brazil, uh, uh, Joe Curiali and Sperry published a paper that did that for some oils, I believe, from the 
I can't remember the name of the basin, but they did that in in, uh, in uh, Brazil. So that's one way to get at it. It's difficult. Uh, it, it's difficult, but it can be done. Yeah, the best way to approach this is to build a chemometric model based on the oils, then go back and drop your rock extracts in one at a time into the chemometric model and see see if any of them fit. Usually that's gonna be the high hydrogen index portions of the, of the source rock. And then you may, you may resort to distributed source rock sampling where you weight the results based on the hydrogen index for each of those individual rock samples. So that's one way of approaching it. The, the question about bias, that was the first question. Uh, how do you avoid how do you avoid bias? Well, we front end all of these studies with geochemical expertise. So I look at what I know to be source rock, uh, source related parameters, right? I know that homolog ratios, for example, are usually pretty good source related parameters. I know that isotopes are usually pretty good source related parameters. The ones that work are gonna differ between different studies, okay? So you need to go into, and you, you don't just get the result immediately. You go in, you run the, run the hierarchical cluster analysis, you test the, the loadings, the principal, you, you test the loadings of each of those parameters to see how much they contribute to differentiating the groups. So there's, there's mathematics involved and that's done with your software, but you can assign uh, the, the parameters with the highest loadings to make the decision about what the families are. Then to really test it, you look at it in principal component space and you say, gee, these samples are forming a nice tight cluster and I feel good inside that, they, that this makes geologic sense. That's the bottom line is once you've done all the chemometrics and you've verified the loadings, that the loadings are significant for each of the parameters you use, and you go and you say, well, does this make sense geologically? Does this family plot stratigraphically in an isolated unit? Or is it one portion of the basin that it plots in? And uh, th this is part of the, inter this is part of being a geochemical interpreter. Nice, thank you, Kim. Peter, so uh, I will uh, ask more two questions. So I will ask Peter to try to answer. We have more two or three questions in our chat and the YouTube. Sure. It would be very nice if you could uh, answer the questions after. So and I think that we are, it's nice to, to if we, we finish uh, now, just more two questions, okay? It's okay for you? Sure. Okay, so the 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 next question is from Hanzo from Calgary, and how bullish are you on attempts to apply novel machine learning methods on larger geochemical data sets, uh, for example, IGI, NPD, MPDs, uh, to derive new insights and knowledge? Nice talk, cheers from Calgary, Hanzo Silva. Yeah, and yeah, I, good... I would like. To I would like to ask to, to add something uh, that it's a conjugate question. And uh, you have presented an amazing work based on the, some classical geochemical parameters on, and you apply the chemometrics in order to help you with this big data. Uh, we, we used to say here in Brazil that the, the holy grail for, for the geochemistry interpretation is try to identify the kitchens and the migration pathways. I think this is the is the the main objective of the geochemistry interpretation. And what is the next step of the geochemistry in terms of new technologies and new applications, artificial intelligence? So try to conjugate these two questions. Yeah, yeah, those are those are tough questions because those are sort of cutting edge questions. Uh, I can say this, uh, I have not done myself, I've not done any machine learning studies. I do know that chemometrics is a subset of machine learning. Chemometrics 
in chemometrics, the algorithms assume a linear relationship. They assume linear relationships with, uh, with samples. For example, if you want to deconvolute a mixture, you use alternating least squares, which is a chemometric method, and you use concentrations, not ratios. <laughs> not ratios, you use concentrations. Because the algorithm is assumes a linear regression. Now, chemometrics being a subset of machine learning, machine learning doesn't assume a linear relationship between any parameters. So it's it 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 takes the data and it says, well, uh, how can I improve the interpretation? And it doesn't necessarily mean that the relationship is linear. So uh, yeah, I've seen papers on. Uh, machine learning, and it's really a buzzword right now, I think, that a lot of people are using. I haven't really seen any papers that I think show that they're clearly superior to, uh, you know, sort of chemometric linear regression type of uh, algorithms for making predictions. Uh, that that will, that maybe is something that is, is going gonna, is gonna to show up in the future. But uh, again, uh, chemo, the uh, uh, nonlinear regression, nonlinear regression is, is basically what we're talking about in machine learning. Um, now the migration issue, that's, that's another one that uh, identifying migration paths, you can predict migration paths with basin modeling, of course, uh, but from geochemical standpoint, actually measuring and uh, predicting, for example, migration distances, a lot of people are working on that. Um, it's a very complex problem because you've got mixing all along that migration pathway that, that can confuse things. Um, yeah, that's, that's an area that I haven't really done any, any work on, although Renzo who has, is asking the question here about, uh, uh, about machine learning has done, I think, some, some of the classic work to start this off, looking at uh, benzocarbazoles, him and Steve Larder, looking at benzocarbazoles and, and those... Uh, and, and, and other compounds for, for measuring migration distance and pathways. So thank you so much, Ken Peter. So unfortunately, we have to finish uh, this, this uh, webinar. Uh, it's a big pleasure to have you with us. Uh, you always support the Alago initiatives for a long time. So thank you so much. And I would like to highlight that, again, that we will have another talk in May 6th and will be about the source rock type and oil generation potential. This presentation will be given uh, by Liliana Lopez from Venezuela, UCV. Uh, so thank you for your time. It was an amazing uh, talk. I think that we have good opportunity to exchange experience uh, people we have different uh, we have people from different parts of the world uh, so thank you for everybody thank you for your yeah, it was a, it was a pleasure Igor. I, I really enjoyed I really enjoyed it and thank you for inviting me to present okay so uh, bye bye uh, good evening for everybody and thank you for your for your time with us bye bye <laughs>